sitting by him. So he's going to actually believe what I have to say up here until the car was stolen by someone when his son was at uni. So it's a little red racy country car because I was a girl from the bush back then. So there you go. It's great to make connections. A bit of useless information you didn't need to know, but it has given a few of you a bit, few more minutes to get yourself settled down the back there. So we ended our first, we started our first session. We ended our first session um, focusing on the Perth Basin. And that's where we're going to start session number two today. Uh, ASX listed Warrigo Energy is an ambitious exploration development and production uh, business, which has a very significant potential in Spain. However, the focus for this fellow here, their CEO and MD, Dennis Donald, and yes, he would be a Scotsman. He's slightly jet lagged, so please play nicely with him. Um, here at RIU is their Western Australian assets. It's where he and his head rock geek, Paul Robinson, who you may, is where's Paul? Where'd Paul end up in the audience? He's, he's up the back there. Okay, so Paul is his head rock geek. I've been, I have on, um, good authority. Uh, they believe that here in WA is where they have some assets that we are going to be very, very interested in as a collective, including the world-class West Era Gala Field. Will you please make him very welcome? Thanks very much. You hear me okay? Well, good morning, everyone. There's a lot going on in the North Perth Basin, and you heard from our JV partner strike before the break. I'd like to talk to you today about Warrigal's ability to grow its reserves and resources, not only in 469, but the substantial exploration potential in our EPA 0127 block. Usual disclaimer, you can see this on our, uh, on our website. Uh, Warrigal's strategy is focusing on identifying, appraising, and developing a high quality portfolio of natural gas, power generation, and potential hydrogen and CCS projects in Australia and Spain. Energy policy throughout the world is rapidly changing in response to the need for energy security, which is having a positive effect on our activities and portfolio. And in fact, I'm not talking about Spain today, but the changes in Europe are absolutely staggering. Um, we're also conscious that gas is the primary transition fuel for many economies, and we're aligning our business so that we can achieve net zero by 2050. We also have significant potential in Spain, which we'll expand on in subsequent forums. Uh, this matrix gives a good summary of our strategy and activities. And as I've said previously, today I want to focus on our activities in Western Australia, particularly in 469, where we're developing the West Aragala gas project and ev evaluating further high-grade exploration targets and the massive exploration potential we have on EPA 0127. I'd like to say a little bit on our carbon zero strategy, which is uh, relevant to all of the all of the uh, operators in this forum, I suspect. While our current emissions profile is negligible, we're developing a carbon strategy that can evolve with the company and our projects. We're currently adopting a new framework and establishing a baseline data. Each project will have its own carbon strategy. For example, West Aragala gas process and emissions will be managed by AGIG. And we've also implemented a series of solar projects in Spain, not unnaturally. So coming on to EP469 and unlocking the future growth potential. Drilling in West Aragala 3 and Strike Energy South Aragala 1 supports the recent independent resource certification by NSAI. And has really highlighted that the West Aragala gas field has further reserves to be gained. This is a photograph from the actual flare. I know Stuart's very proud of that. W3 drilling and testing has demonstrated the outstanding nature of the northern part of the West Aragala field. It confirms that we have 100 meters of gas column, 100 meters of gas column. It also confirms quality reservoir, high gas saturations that have given rise to exceptional stabilized flow rates and flowing wellhead pressures. And it also supports the assumptions in the NSAI Ju July 2022 certified reserves upgrade. And we're currently with our joint venture partner evaluating data and samples from the well test. And in fact, we believe that the South Aragala may unlock more reserves for West Aragala. I'd like to point out that further reserves increases are indeed possible in the sudden extent of the central area of the West Aragala. South Aragala 1 
as reported by Strike Energy, encountered gas that's connected to the West Aragal. Warrigal's recent mapping, remapping indicates a potential increase in rock volumes above the likely gas water contact of 4630. And this could translate into potential reserves increase that was not assessed in the recent NSAI certification, July 2022. So we still think there's a hell of a lot more in 469. And as an example of this, I'd point out the Aragela Deep. Aragela Deep is in the northeast area, it's situated between West Aragela and Lockyer Deep. And uh, I suspect there's not many people in this forum won't know about the tremendous success that Lockyer Deep was. Warrigal's estimated unrisk prospective resource, this is Warrigal's unrisk prospective resource of Aragela Deep is between 160 and 400 BCF. As a further example, if you look down in the southwest corner of EP469 is the Sundalara structure. It's recently been identified by Strike as an extension of the South Aragela structure. We really do believe that 469 has a lot more treasure, treasures to reveal. And in terms of our gas reserves growth pathway, we think there's a potential for more reserves in West Aragela, as well as a number of adjacent structures. As I've said, example being the Aragela Deep. And we're very keen to capture the 3D seismic. It's maybe not commonly understood, but only one third of 469 has been shot by 3D seismic. And the intent is to shoot the further two thirds of that block next year. Look, this morning I'm mostly discussing subsurface potential today, but I wanted to provide a quick summary of where we are with the West Aragala gas project. And going down to the last bullet point, first gas is anticipated by the end of 2024. Moving on to 127, and, and until today's, we haven't really said too much about it. And we're actually quite proud to be rolling it out now. now I'm not a rock geek, as we said at the, at the start, but Paul's here with me. So if any of you that are of that disposition um, would like more information, please um, get, get a hold of Paul uh, later on and ask him the, the difficult questions that I almost certainly won't be able to answer. Um, Warrigal's EPA 0127 block is in the final approvals phase, and I'm making a bold statement here. It has the potential to be the next Perth Basin. I understand that people say, wow, that's optimistic. But the same was said in of 469 when I founded the business 10 years ago. And the fact of the matter is, at that time, the only other people that had the faith was Strike Energy. So a bold statement, that's fine. That's the statement we're making. So what about 127? Well, EPA 127 is situated directly to the north of the Perth Basin. It's a massive block. 2 million acres. In fact, if you say to Scottish people, the block's 2, two million acres, their eyes glaze over. That's a fifth the size of my country. You live in a very big country. I don't live in a very big country. It straddles almost the entire Cool Kalaya sub-basin, and importantly, it's bisected by the Dampier Bunbury gas pipeline. We're absolutely delighted that Mitsu exploration and production have agreed to farm in. With Mitsui farming in, we have an excellent partner, access to technology and world-class capabilities. And importantly for us, a partner that's a member of the Northwest Shelf. Permit grants anticipated at the end of 2022 and an accelerated work program is currently being planned. And it is accelerated and it is pretty ambitious. Now, moving on to the general rocks inherent in uh, 127. As seen on this regional gravity image, the Cool Kalaya subbasin is, is the link between the North Perth Basin and the onshore Southern Carnarvon Basin. It's an estimated 4,000 meters of sedimentary section that exists below 127, so significant. <laughs> These sediments are seen to the south and north are likely to comprise of known prospective Permian and older, older age reservoirs and source rocks. Recent gravity and magnetic data processing and modeling have identified multiple positive anomalies extending the length of this considerable permit area. 
These anomalies are likely to be massive structures within the sedimentary sequence and are likely to be similar in size to those known in the North Perth Basin. This map shows the relative scale. So extremely large block. The Cool Kalaya Subbasin is asymmetric with a deep potential kitchen area along the entire Eastern margin. We believe that potential expelled hydrocarbons would migrate up dip to the West. The identified gravity anom anomalies, tens to hundreds of square kilometers in area, are well situated to receive charge. And the approved 127 work program is comprehensive, with the first three years comprising extensive gravity, magnetics, and seismic acquisition. Stratigraphic and exploration well drilling will form the second half of the exploration program. I hope this very short talk, it's short and sweet, just like myself, has indeed summarized the significant potential that Warrigal has in 4.6, not only in 4.6.9, just to remind you, we've still got another two thirds of the block to shoot with 3D seismic and in its EPA 127. And I've also, I hope I've also explained to you in general terms, the direction of the company. Thank you. Good idea, Dennis Donald. Thank you. I hope it was worth your uh, getting onto an aeroplane and coming all the way over here from Scotland. What's the weather like compared to your summer Scotland, Scottish um, weather at the moment? Listen, we, we operate in three uh, regions in the world, which is um, uh, uh, near, um, near Cadiz mm -hmm. and Western Australia. And of course, I live in Scotland, so I'm not do, doing too bad for locations in the world. Yeah. I can hear you, you're struggling. Go and grab yourself a chair out there and put your hands together for him again, please, everyone. I'm impressed that your baggage made it here as well, too. That's good. <laughs> All right, team. Our next presenter is blessed with a giant gas resource. And I smile as I say that. Got to be taken in so many ways, couldn't it? But he's blessed with a giant gas resource, potentially a big deal with China as well, with the why and the how, the how and the why and all the details in between. Would you please welcome to the stage from Bondi to the Gobi Basin to here, Gobi Basin to here in Perth, Brendan Statz, who is the CEO of TMK Energy. What this man doesn't know about Mongolia apparently has not been printed or put into Google. Please make him welcome. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, so my name is Brendan Stats, and I'm the CEO of TMK Energy Limited. Um, TMK Energy Limited is Australian oil and gas exploration company, and we're focused on 100% owned Gavantes coal seam gas project located in the South Gobi Basin of Mongolia. So I'm not sure how many of you have been to the South Gobi Basin of Mongolia. Um, Probably not a, not that many. It's not the it's not really on the tourist trail. So I just sort of put up some uh, pictures and a bit of a video just to give you a feel for the environment and the landscape of uh, of our project in the South Gobi. And just while I introduce myself, um, so I'm a geolog geologist by background, and I've lived and worked in Mongolia for over ten years. Um, my work in Mongolia has been primarily being focused on coal exploration and mining. So Mong Mongolia is well known for its uh, large coal deposits. There's uh, significant deposits in the South Gobi, Tavan Tolwoi, Nara and Sukhite, where there's extensive coal mining. But no one's really looked at the, these, these, these coal deposits for their, their coal seam gas potential until recently in the last couple of years, where there's several uh, Australian companies really bringing the expertise from Australia, uh, evaluating the potential of these coal seam gas uh, of these of these coal fields for coal seam gas potential. And, and TMK Limited is one of those companies leading the charge in, in Mongolia. Um, so we, we see there's enormous potential in Mongolia in these coal fields for coal seam gas potential. But the other key advantage is its proximity to yeah, the largest energy market in the world in China. Um, so yeah, China's a very large and growing energy market and with a particular appetite for gas. And there's obviously significant advantages in terms of delivery cost in finding gas in Mongolia and, uh, and delivering it to uh, China. So that in a nutshell is TMK's mission. We're out to find a giant gas resource on the doorstep of, uh, of China. Um, so this is just a quick snapshot of, um, of TMK and a bit of background on the Gavantes project. Um, 
So I've been involved in the Gavantes project since its inception in January 2019, when we were awarded the prospecting agreement. Uh, over the last couple of years, we uh, I'll just go through some of the key highlights. So we, we signed a, uh, a farming agreement with uh, Talon Energy, who you'll hear from later this afternoon, uh, to fund the first two work programs. Uh, we obtained the production sharing contract and exploration license in 2021. And then in, in 2022, TMK Energy acquired the uh, Gavantes project. So they, TMK, we, we acquired the project in, uh, in uh, February and we started drilling in March. So we've been drilling for the last five months. And this is, this is the first coal seam gas exploration, which has occurred in this part of the South Gobi Basin. Uh, and, and, the, and the exploration program is five, five exploration wells, of which we've completed three and a half. And we've currently got two drill rigs currently drilling on site to finish the program. And we expect to finish that program in the next couple of weeks. Um, looking forward, uh, we complete the exploration program. The results from the exploration program feed into our maiden, maiden contingent resource uh, estimate, which based on the results, which I'll, I'll go into in more detail, but we expect that to be significant. And then based on the early success from the exploration, we've, we've uh, commenced the planning for a pilot well program, which will kick off this year and uh, flow gas to surface uh, early next year. And that's where we'll get our picture of the, uh, of the gas flare. So I guess 2022 has been a transformational year with, for TMK with the acquisition of, of this Gavantes project. So just a little bit more detail on the actual Gavantes project. Um, so as you can hopefully see from the tiny map up there in the corner, um, it's located in the very south of Mongolia. And it's actually 20 kilometres from the, uh, the border with China and a, and a designated border crossing. And, uh, and you, you might be able to make out there, but it's also located close to the existing gas infrastructure in northern China with the main west-east pipeline running 400 kilometres to the south. And as you might have appreciated from the, uh, the earlier video, uh, in terms of surface constraints, um, there's no towns, there's no people, there's no rivers, forests. Um, uh, so in the way of surface constraints, there's very little and it's quite an easy place to do exploration. There's uh, basically there's camels and rocks and, and a few operating coal mines and that's about it. So easy to do exploration. So the other key advantage of this project is the geological understanding. So the geological, it's, geological understanding is reasonably well defined from uh, the extensive exploration which has occurred in the last 15 years for coal in this in this part of the basin so we have access to we've collated two and a half thousand drill holes um and two and a half thousand drill holes just roughly talks to a you know a cost of say 100 100 million us in terms of a uh, drilling cost but more importantly probably saves us five to ten years in terms of greenfields exploration so the geology is reasonably well defined so that's given us a real head start with our exploration and allowed, uh, uh, enabled us to really focus um, on the coal seam gas aspects and the geological understanding is also the basis of a of a, of a uh, prospective resource estimate of six tcf or six trillion cubic feet of gas so very big prospective resource and uh, completed by netherlands sul uh, so it's eight and a half thousand square kilometres. So it's a big project, uh, big potential, big prospective resource. And, uh, and this year we've gone about proving up that potential. So onto the, onto the results of this year's program. So these are, I've just presented the results from the four, four wells. Um, one of those wells is still drilling at the moment. There's uh, two coal seams, an upper and a lower, and uh, we've intersected the upper coal seam and we're still drilling to the lower coal seam. But these are the results from the first four wells. And, and we call it 100% success because all four wells have intersected thick coal with high gas, high gas saturation. Uh, the gas is uh, high methane, 96% average, low CO2, under 2%. And then the per permeability, in, uh, a mixed bag, but uh, the upper seam, for example, uh, has delivered permeability between 20 and 47 milladarcies, which is very high. So these are the these are the key technical parameters for a coal seam gas project, and all four wells have delivered exceptional results. So that's why we call it a 100% success rate. The, the other important uh, aspect of this is that those four wells are located approximately two and a half kilometres apart, so they're spread across a, a basically 10 kilometre strike. And uh, we, we knew the coal was there from the existing data set and the operating coal mines, but and We've, we're focused on a relatively small area this year, but we do know that the coal extends another 150 kilometres to the east along strike. So we've started at the western portion where the coal outcrops, and we're, uh, this year we're focused on this area, but we do not a 10 kilometre area, but we do know that the coal continues for 150 kilometres. So looking forward, we expect uh, more success with the exploration. 
Um, and just some of the other key points here, uh, at the coal thickness of 60 to 90, 90 metres, like that's very thick in terms of uh, coal and particularly coal seam gas. So, um, very, you know, great results. And I guess just to put the results into context, um, I've, I've put them in a table here, which might be a bit too small to read, but this is comparing our results with the major coal seam gas uh, fields worldwide in the US and Australia and China, and just looking at the key technical parameters. And um, I'm not sure whether you can read the detail there, but um, in summary, the results we've achieved uh, uh, are equal to or better than these existing developed coal seam gas projects all around the world. And, and I guess a key feature of the, of the project is the coal thickness and the high gas contents. Um, we're talking 60 to 91 metres there. Uh, Coal seam gas can be developed in uh, yeah, typically um, five to 20 metres of coal and, uh, and the gas content's very high. So, and I guess what the, what the results point to really looking forward to development is uh, simple, inexpensive development with high production rates and high operating margins. So that's really what the geologies are, the results are pointing to. Uh, of course, we have the size and scale, 6 TCF and very few surface constraints, as I've mentioned. But the other key advantage of the project, as I touched on earlier, is really uh, the, the location and the access to markets. So, so I'll just focus on the markets for a second. So currently where we're drilling, within five kilometres of where we're currently drilling, there's 20 to 30 megawatts of demand for power. And that's associated with the operating coal mines uh, within, within our uh, close proximity to where we're drilling. Uh, and they, their forecast, uh, Growth in demand for power is 60 to 70 megawatts. If, if we can, if they can get a reliable power supply, they currently operate on uh, diesel generation and uh, a small power line from China. And so uh, um, that's a very uh, opportune, a very good opportunity for early commercialization of the project. We'd, we'll be doing the pilot well program later this year and hopefully flowing gas early next year. And any gas we can, can produce can be used on site uh, to support those mining operations. So that's just the early commercialization opportunity while we look to develop or evaluate a much bigger uh, development program. And just, just in Mongolia in general, um, there's numerous applications for uh, domestic gas in Mongolia. Um, but I, without going into detail, I guess it could just be summarized by there is a very strong desire for domestic uh, production of low cost, reliable, cleaner uh, energy. And, and, and we think we can feed into this market as well. But for, for a big gas project, you need a big gas market. And, uh, and uh, fortunately, we're right next door to the biggest, biggest market of them all in China. Uh, China's energy demands are significant and the challenges they face meeting those demands are, uh, are significant. So there's, there's plenty of information out there on the, on the Chinese gas, gas thematics in terms of uh, uh, forecast uh, um, uh, gas demand and supply deficit. Um, and the key is, I think, we're, we're well placed, being 20 kilometres across the border, to um to feed into that market and 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 um, china currently gets its gas uh, uh through pipelines from uh, turkmenistan russia myanmar and so uh in terms of geopolitical risk uh, those three are probably up there whereas 20 kilometers across the border in mongolia existing trading partner um very good relations mongolia china so a number of advantages there uh, and a significant cost advantage, as I mentioned, in terms of delivering gas into China. Um, so how are we going to deliver gas into China? So re recently, as last month, we signed an MOU with PetroChina uh, Dutch in Tumsag, which is 100% subsidiary of PetroChina. Mm -hmm. And so PetroChina Tumsag are an existing operator in Mongolia. Uh, they're the operator of the oil fields in, in the eastern Mongolia and the only uh, developed oil fields in Mongolia. They've been there since 2008, so they're an experienced operator in Mongolia. Um, and the other important, and, and PetroChina, under the PetroChina umbrella, they have access to uh, uh, all sorts of resources uh, which can facilitate uh, um, the development of our project. And, and they have experience here yeah, with the full breadth of the value supply chain, exploration, development, infrastructure and markets. And infrastructure and markets probably been the important ones for us. And importantly, PetroChina owns and operates that, that gas pipeline uh, network in, in northern China, close to our... Uh, to our project so and i think being able to introduce a uh, a major like petro china to our project at the very early stage we, we we talk about we we drilled our first well in uh in march i think that talks to the quality of the project and also the potential scale of the project so this this is the plan that we put out at the at the start of the year 
and uh, yeah, the drilling's been a bit slow, and uh, um, there's been all sorts of things. But in actual fact, we're, we're hitting our milestones. So this is a plan we said we'd impl implement at the start of the year, and we've, we've hit these targets. Um, and so looking forward, the next steps, we'll complete the exploration program uh, in the next couple of weeks. That'll feed into our maiden contingent resource number as expect in, in October, which we expect to be uh, significant. Uh, and really summarise uh, the results to date and put them into a, a simple 2C number. Um, and then we kick off the pilot well program. And the pilot well program is really about delivering gas to the surface and demonstrating the, uh, the commerciality of the project. Um, and, and so just when we step back and look at this uh, timetable, so we, we acquired the project in February, we started drilling in March, and we're, we aim to uh, flow first gas to surface early next year. So as I, as I mentioned, we're moving very quickly through the, uh, the early exploration evaluation, evaluation stages. You know, within 12 months, we've, uh, we've taken the project forward, uh, you know, a giant, giant steps. So the investment opportunity, I think we've got the, we've got the project, um, yeah, the, the size of the prize, 6 TCF on the doorstep of China, that's the project, and we've been able to deliver on the exploration results, proving up that potential. Uh, we've got the near-term catalysts. We've, we've had a busy year, and we've got a busy uh, next 12 months. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of news flow to come out, and uh, contingent resources, uh, pilot well, first gas, uh, early commercialisation. So there's a lot of near-term near catalysts, and, and we're also well-funded through uh, through implementing this plan uh, via the cash in the bank, but also our, our farm out agreement with uh, Talon Energy, who, who will be uh, funding the, uh, the pilot well program. So it's, um, I think it's a very exciting time for TMK. Um, and I think we present, a, you know, we present a unique opportunity for uh, uh, an early, early stage exploration and evaluation, which is delivering on results. And, uh, uh, and, yeah, and, and identifying a big project as we set out to do, identify a big gas resource next to a big market. So just quickly on a, on a corporate snapshot, um, the management and board is comprised of Australians and Mongolians with the, the relevant skills, um, uh, relevant skills to uh, move the Gavantes project forward. And, uh, and Dougal Ferguson's here today and Stuart Baker's also around. So uh, if you know those guys and you want to chat more about uh, TMK and Gavantes, please uh, feel free to, uh, to grab those guys. Um, the usual disclaimer, and uh, and this presentation will be available on the web. So, um, and so I encourage if you if we've tweaked your interest, please uh, look at our website and uh, and look at the information online there, or or come grab me. I'll be around the co uh, the conference today. So, always happy to chat and uh, and answer any questions. So, uh, thanks very much for your time. Good on you, Brendan. How's your jet lag going, adding the one-year-old baby to that as well? I was thinking of poor, poor old Dennis coming from Scotland, but you've been travelling around and you've got the one-year-old baby. How are you coping? Um, yeah, it's good It's good to get to Mongolia. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's why I come. I've got four kids at home. I come here for a break. And yeah, listen to you guys. It is. But your voice is beautiful. I was thinking if it was a one-year-old, it'd just be going quietly, beautifully to sleep, believing every word that you said. I've got the gift. Thanks for coming today. Thanks for taking the time and look forward to hearing about more of a, more information in the years to come too. Uh, we're going to stay overseas with our next presenter. And this is another location that I'm going to say, I'll take a stab and say many of us may not have visited this place. We're going to Timor. Sunder Gas Banda is a subsidiary of London AM listed Baron Oil PLC. Now, this company is focused on maturing and developing the large Chudich gas discovery in the prolific Plover Formation, which is on trend with uh, Bayo and Dan, Greater Sunrise, Evan Scholl, and also Barossa. This is their first time at RIU. They've heard good things about us and they've heard good things about this conference. So let's make him really welcome. This gentleman is Dr. Andy Butler. He is the Managing Director of Sunder Gas. Please make him welcome, everyone. Thank you, Chrissy. Thanks. You, you, you're quite right. This is my first time at, at an RIU. It's, uh, it's great to be here. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. And, and it's great to see so many familiar faces. I'd forgotten how many people I knew in Perth and uh, so having a really good catch up. So, yeah, my name is Andy Butler. I'm the Founder and Managing Director of Sunder Gas. Uh, and I'm here really today to talk to you about Timor-Leste and in particular our Chudage uh, gas field that we have there and really to raise awareness of that project and, and hopefully show you some, some interesting aspects of what we're trying to do. So here's some highlights of what I'm going to cover in the next 14 and a half minutes. Um, the Chudage field is a, a, a very large gas resource, uh, we believe. It's in shallow water, obviously located on the, on the prolific plover trend. We've spent the last couple of years 
reprocessing a very extensive 3D seismic survey that, that covers that old, that old discovery. Um, that work is just about complete uh, and is looking very, very encouraging. Uh, and we're presently interpreting that. And so I'm going to be showing you some, some real hot off the press information from, uh, from what we're doing there. Initially, we think we're dealing with a in-place gas resource. I say they're four and a half TCF. I think it's probably about five TCF of, of gas in place and a concentration of those resources into the key discovery that, that, uh, that Shell made 25 years ago. So a, a really material resource. Um, people always ask me, yeah, great. You know, you're stuck in the middle of the team or C. What are you going to do with it? Uh, well, we, I will show you. I think we have multiple export options for, for that gas. Um, and, uh, and so we're looking forward to completing our present evaluation phase and going into some uh, appraisal drilling next year. And we're, we're out offering opportunities for people to, to join us in, in doing that. Um, but first of all, a brief introduction to, to, to Timor-Leste. Um, I mean, it, it is obviously your immediate neighbor, um, but I suspect, as Chrissy said, that uh, probably very few people here have actually been there. Um, and I'll, I'll make a plug, first of all, for Timor-Leste. It is it's a young, vibrant, open country. Um, many of you are probably aware of the very traumatic history that they've had during our, our lifetimes. But but it's also, uh, it's it's a beautiful country. It's wonderful people. It's got the best coffee in the world. Um, and, it, and it's just up the road. I'm sure you've all been to Bali and never been to Timor. I, I highly recommend a visit and a tour around, uh, around the place. Um, it is a country that's poor. It's got substantial development challenges. Its economy since independence has been solely really reliant on, on the Bayundan field operated by Conoco and then more likely Santos. Uh, that's weeks away from, from uh, decommissioning um, and is expected to convert into a, a CCS facility. And you, you see that often in the news, the activities that Santos are carrying out there. Um, in the, since Bayundan came on, a, a sovereign wealth fund, the National Petroleum Fund, has been established, and that has, um, but that is now being drawn down. So there's a lot of pressure from governments to, to, to move forward with, with these other assets. And the only other substantial fields offshore are Greater Sunrise and, and as I think I'll show you, Chudditch. Sundergas itself, um, we operate that asset, what you can see on the map there, with, uh, with a 75% working interest. We partner with the national oil company known as Timor Gap. They have representatives here as well. I encourage you to chat to them. Um, and we are, we, our parent shareholder is a London-listed company called Barron Oil, listed on the AIM exchange. So if you're interested in what I've got to show, then that's, that's where you should look. Um, we have a, a good presence in Dili uh, with, with, uh, with a team that's established uh, and shown there. Just a bit of background and context on what's going on in the Timor Sea. So we're, um, as you're probably aware, uh, Greater Sunrise operated by Woodside, uh, now majority owned by the Timorese government through, uh, through Timor Gap, and there's an ongoing story there that I won't go into. Santos is a key player in this region, of course, having bought Conoco's assets, uh, which includes Biondan, which they converted to CCS. Barossa, which is now uh, in well into development phase, um, and of course Darwin LNG and all a lot of the infrastructure in between. They, uh, they another key player is ENI, who operate the uh, the key Evan, the very large Evan Shoal field and, and partner with Santos and have an MOU to to really take this uh, the, the gas resources in this basin forward, um, and who have been awarded very recently the block just to the north of us in inside Timor Leste waters. Um, and as, as you've seen also in recent press, of course, there's a lot going on in the CCS space with awards of acreage to the south of us. Um, and over the overriding point, of course, is the gas prices that we're, uh, we're benefiting from in, in this part of the world. Okay, so Chodesh gas itself, um, we're in the core of the, of the plover trend. We've got great reservoirs akin to what you see in, in Biodan. We're just a long strike from it. We um, uh, are well drilled by Shell in 1998 in shallow water, 65 meters, discovered gas and the normal pressures at about 2,900 meters. As part of a trend, I'll show you, that's about 60 kilometers long of proven, or of discovered rather, and, uh, and, and prospective resources. LNG scale resources, it's a great operating environment and good PSC terms. Okay, just um, there's a little bit of geological content uh, within the presentation. I am a geologist, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain briefly what we're looking at. So this is a regional transect across uh, across the area where we're operating. You'll see from the index map, we've got sun, sunrise off to the north of us. This big feature through the center of the, of the profile there is known as the Melita Graben, a deep, uh, deep basin that's developed. And we're right on the flank of, of, of that. Um, the orange is the, the Plover Sandstone, regionally very continuous, very good reservoirs. And overlying it, where we are, the, the purple section are lower Cretaceous shales, mud rocks that are fabulous regional seals, and all hydrocarbons around us stay underneath that. So we have a, a really good patrolling system that operates. And, and 
uh, the map on the right hand side, the 3D visualization shows that effectively where we're sit, sitting is on a spur that, right, that comes southwards off the Greater Sunrise High. And Greater Sunrise obviously is a world class gas condensate resource. The map on the right is our petroleum systems work, red is gas, um, basically where we think it's coming from and where it's going to. Ultimately, a lot of it is going northwards to sunrise, um, but you'll see that Chudditch and, and our PSC is optimally located for the, uh, for the maturation and migration of gases into the structures that we identify. So the, uh, what, what actually, uh, what does this gas resource look like? What have we discovered? So. Um, or rather, what did Shell discover 25 years ago and, and not do anything with? Well, they drilled a really interesting well. The, the log on the left-hand side, yellow is sandstone. And you can see that it's almost all sandstone and they had, um, the, and it carries on below the bottom of the well. So well over 100 meters of very high quality sandstone. They drilled some way away from the fault that you'll see on the cartoon on, on the right um, for operational reasons. And they decided to drill a vertical well from an optimal surface location. Um, and encountered about 30 meters of gas, about 25 meters of, of net gas um, in this very good sandstone. And so the, the whole hypothesis of what we are doing going into this is to say, well, what happens as you go from that well off to the fault? Uh, and, and as you can see from this cartoon model, really we see that there's a big wedge up dip of very significant gas resource potential that's there. The real challenge we had is that data was very poor and you couldn't really see what was going on between the well and the, and the fault. The, the orange box indicates the quality of the reservoir. We had, we had a great 101 on, uh, on permeabilities this morning. The, the average permeabilities here are about 200 millidarcies within that pay zone. The, uh, the maximum permeabilities are more than 1,000. So uh, as, as, uh, as we learned, that's, that's a great place to be uh, looking, developing gas. OK. So our sort of primary activity has been to, uh, to, to look at reprocessing the old seismic data to see to really visualize what's going on between the, the, the well and the fault there. The cartoon map shows that all the features that we'd identified from the old data, you see in red, the discovery and the, and the well, which is somewhere away from the fault. Um, and in orange, all the other prospective features around it that, that, uh, that are at, at the same level and uh, the same reservoir, same sort of depths, et cetera. Okay, across all of that on, on the original data, we were looking at about a gas resource of three and a half TCF recoverable as a, as a, as a mean resource. Um, but imaging uncertainty meant we, we we didn't have a great confidence of that, and it was all considered prospective, despite having a, a good discovery in there. So we've reprocessed just under 1,300 square kilometers of 3D data, the, the blue rectangle there, which is basically all that's available on the, on the area where we're operating. And that work is just about complete. So here uh, I will show you some seismic examples of, of what we're dealing with. These are three very the, the same profile with different data sets through the discovery so the well you can see the vertical line in there um, and the, uh, the 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 plover sandstone is the section right right at the base the line on the left it's, this is in time data is uh is really very poor quality what happens between in that area between i should attempt to indicate this between the well and and in here it's noisy um you know you may not all uh all be be geophysicists but i can tell you that there's extremely poor data um the data in the middle panel there is, is essentially what we're, we're receiving at the moment, and there's a lot more clarity in that data and, and definition of the fault. And the data on the right is effectively an optimized version of that as well, where we're really homing in on the, 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 the relevant frequencies and, and parts of the data uh, that are relevant to imaging the, uh, the plover sandstone. And you can see we've now got a product we can work with. And so we've now got maps that, of which we have a great deal more confidence. Okay, there's a lot of work that takes you from that to this, and everything here is, is very much hot off the press. Um, the, the rectangle that you can see with the colors within it, that's the 3D outline area we're dealing with. And, and, and really what these colors are showing is just the thickness of plover sandstone above the, the closure point or the gas water contacts in the discovery and the adjacent features. Um, the, the polygons also go off the end of that rectangle into the broader data that, that's available. And we're integrating all of that at the moment. And really what the data is pointing at, and I say this is all very provisional, is that we are seeing, uh, we are validating the Chudditch discovery as a very material resource. Um, we, are, we are seeing a concentration of the gas resources that we didn't envisage previously into that discovery. Um, and we are seeing that the, the discoveries that go off the end of the 3D are also looking very robust. And so in total, I, I indicate there, we think there's a gas in place number in the order of four and a half TCF. Um, if anything, we think that's an underestimate from the, the very latest data that, that we're, the very latest mapping that we're presently undertaking. So hugely encouraging. Um, with recovery factors in sort of 60, 70%, you can see that we're dealing with a, with a really very significant resource here. Okay. 
so this is the well that we hope to drill. I hope to drill late next year. Um, basically twinning at surface, the uh, the shell discovery, but at about 1100 meters after 13 three eighths, taking a, a dog leg and, uh, and uh, following the fault trajectory to go up dip so that we encounter in excess of 100 meters of, of gas pay um, and are really targeting, proving up a resource with that well uh, of about 1.2 TCF. Okay, the well cost we're expecting is about, about $24 million, but that includes a, a full test, which obviously is something we're anticipating doing given the nature of this discovery. Um, so then what? As I'm back to my earlier question. So you've got this great gas resource, you've got to take it forward. Um, just very quickly, there are many advantages to this asset. Unlike, for example, Sunrise to the north of us, there is an existing PSC. There is not a maritime boundary issue in the middle of it. There's one government to deal with. We've got very large gas resource. We're in shallow water. The blue chart there illustrates the water depths, for example, of Barossa, Sunrise, deeper, more expensive developments to carry out, and Abadi is off the scale. It starts at 700 meters or so. Um, and also we, we have solutions around uh, CCS, which I'll, I'll come to in a moment. So where will it go? Um, and the, the answer is essentially, we, we see a multitude of options for, for exporting gas from this area. We are certainly not dealing with a stranded gas resource. We're in the middle of the Timor Sea. There are uh, routes to the north of us, there are routes to the south of us, and there are routes directly to market standalone. Going northwards, Sunrise, if it gets, gets developed, takes us towards uh, the, a greenfield LNG on the island of Timor. There are lots of questions around that. Southwards, sorry, last orders. Um, Southwards uh, with Darwin as possibilities and, and also standalone at Chudditch, um, which I think it offers many advantages. And standalone at Chudditch essentially looks like this. What I mean by that is a hybrid floating LNG solution, but levels onto platforms. So a series of wellhead platforms unmanned, tied back to a central facility with a, with a floater there. Um, the the the, uh, the facility shown off to the to the left are, are bio and Dan, which as I said is becoming a CCS. Uh, CCS uh, hub for, for, for the area. Um, that's a possibility. Another possibility is actually, as, as I'll show, I think my next slide, um, there are several other options to do to, to, to do with CO2. I, I should have mentioned the 18% CO2 in, in, in Chudditch gas. That's exactly the same level as, as you have in Barossa, for example. It's something that we have to uh, have to work with. Um, and, and we have a number of solutions. One is to take it to Bayon then. It's about 130 kilometers, requires a pipeline and, and presumably a tariff. One is to, to go to the facilities that are going to emerge to the immediate south of us with the recent licensing round. But actually, my preferred solution is to, 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 to convert or to use Chudditch also as a CCS facility to inject for enhanced gas recovery and potentially take third-party third gas in there. So that's what I wanted to cover. Um, we think we've got a very significant gas resource uh, on, on our PSC in, in that area. We've completed the, uh, the 3D reprocessing. It's looking hugely encouraging. We're evaluating... Uh, are, we're evaluating those data and all the other geological studies that we've carried out um, and are looking forward to drilling a well next year. We see this as a potential very high value development of shallow gas, shallow water gas uh, in, in this region. We see multiple options and we'd love to talk to uh, talk to anyone interested to, to learn more. We have a booth, slide uh, 18. I'm out there, as is my colleague Dino Gandara, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Butler. I hope you enjoy your time here. And uh, he's, he's off to Dilly next, so I can speak to you more about that as well if you want to out there. Now, our next presenter is uh, one of those gentlemen that I always enjoy listening to. He's very passionate about exploration, and building for all stakeholders, and I like to consider him one of those men with integrity. He's a geo, he's a geophysicist by training. He's also responsible for the formation of a number of Australian listed companies. Today, he's here in his capacity as the executive chairman of Buru Energy, and that's a big gas discovery in the Canning Basin. And he may just touch on the success Buru is having with a little side hustle if you've got time today. Would you please make welcome everyone, Eric Streitberg. Oh, thank you very much for that completely unsolicited uh, introduction. Um, uh, I, I've been, I think, to uh, every one of the uh, good oil conferences uh, since I started. I think I missed one through uh, uh, misadventure. Uh, but uh, uh, this is probably going to be the last one that I'm presenting on behalf of Buru. 
Uh, and that's because uh, our new CEO, Thomas Nador, who's in the audience, I think, somewhere. Thomas, yep, up the back there, uh, who you may know uh, through his role in uh, in Beach as their development manager for all their assets uh, uh, across Australia. So Thomas has recently started with us, and uh, that's going to give me the chance to uh, step back a little bit and uh, and focus on uh, new ventures and development. So. Uh, why would Thomas come and join us right now? Well, apart from the fact that uh, Burr is a great company and his chairman is a great guy, uh, that would be me, of course, um, uh, we're, the, the oil and gas uh, uh, sector is, uh, is coming up back to life after some uh, uh, very dire couple of years. And I think it was Mark Twain who famously said, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated, and uh, that's pretty much where we are in the oil and gas business. Let me see if I've got the right buttons to push here. No. Where am I? No. I apologise. I should have taken the lessons. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and this pretty much illustrates uh, how we're coming back to life. The one year uh, Brent price and uh, the one year European gas price. Um, if you saw this in any other commodity, uh, the market would be following it pretty, pretty hard. If you look at lithium, cobalt, and all the rest of the uh, uh, so-called green minerals. And if you look on the, uh, on the right side, there's the five year graphs. So the five-year oil price, uh, Brent's essentially doubled uh, since 2018, and the ASX 200 energy is flat to 2018. So that tells you we've got a, a long way to go to get back to where our, uh, our market value should be. So let's try again. No. Know what is going on? Yeah, apologies. It's uh, it's not working for me. Why? Yeah, no. I've got it. Got it. Thank you. Apologies. Um, so, what do you look for when you're going to invest in a small oil and gas company? Now, I'm very uh, very heavily invested in Buru. I'm very long in Buru, but. I see lots of other opportunities in the sector. So one of the things that you look for uh, to start with, of course, is uh, board and management. Is the board a bunch of uh, compliance driven box tickers or are they actually there to drive value into the company? Well, we're very fortunate our board uh, is in that uh, latter category, all very experienced, all very focused on putting value into the company. Um, then I look at the balance sheet and the commitments. Uh, we're in good shape. We've got uh, uh, 20 odd million dollars on the balance sheet and uh, essentially all our activity going forward is discretionary. So we're not facing a big commitment that's going to wreck the balance sheet. We're able to manage our cash. And of course, in this, uh, uh, in this environment, managing your cash is, uh, is absolutely essential. So, then we look at quality of uh, assets. Our core business is oil and gas. Um, as, as was mentioned, we have a couple of side hustles. I'm not sure I quite <laughs> would like to refer to them as that, but uh, I guess that's, uh, that's the terminology that people understand. So our core business, we produce oil from conventional reservoirs at our Angani field in the, uh, in the Canning Basin. Uh, we have a gas development uh, appraisal and development project on a very large gas discovery that we recently made in the Canning Basin. And importantly, we operate for three joint ventures. Uh, we've got a lot of corporate strength uh, and uh, that gives us the ability to uh, operate for companies uh, that bring a lot of strength to our business as well. So looking at each of those uh, assets, if we look at the Canning Basin, our 
uh, exploration and production activities there. And uh, we also have a exploration and CCS project in the Carnarvon Basin. So in the Canning, we've got a very large acreage holding, uh, 22,000 square kilometres. Uh, as I mentioned, we're uh, a long-term experienced operator in the basin. We're an operating company. We operate for three JVs for major companies, for Origin, uh, for Rock Oil, uh, and also for mineral resources on our CCS project. So we're obviously bringing some skills that uh, these companies like. We had a pretty good drilling program in 2021, uh, made a major gas discovery, 50% uh, uh, success rate. Uh, our 2022 program has basically been focused on commercialization of our, uh, of, of our gas discovery. The Ngani oil field, uh, oil is something that people are very uh, happy to buy off us at the moment. Uh, price is close to $100 a barrel for Brent. We get uh, uh, a nice premium on Brent. Uh, it's a modest uh, production uh, stream at the moment. We're doing about 650 barrels a day. We have 50% of that through uh, and our partner Rock Oil, and we operate for our partner Rock Oil. Uh, we've just increased production quite substantially by a workover on one of our wells, and we're looking to uh, optimise production and also uh, drill some more wells to, uh, to get production up. Of uh, a lot of importance to us, obviously, is our recent gas discovery in the canning. Uh, we've been looking for uh, this for some time. The key to it is that it's a conventional oil discovery. We have a huge unconventional gas endowment in the basin. Uh, and obviously, the uh, developing unconventional resources in Western Australia uh, is still subject to further regulation. So a conventional discovery uh, has been a great outcome. Uh, had relatively modest uh, flow rates compared to what people have been seeing in the uh, in the Perth Basin, uh, 7.6 million a day, but that was only one of three zones in the well. So we're uh, confident we're going to be able to get that up substantially. Of a lot of importance is that uh, there's about uh, 40 barrels a million of condensate. And again, the Perth Basin uh, discoveries of five to 10 barrels a million. So there's a very large endowment of, uh, of condensate in this field. Condensate, uh, as you know, is a light oil and uh, it's a very valuable product uh, that, that comes out with the gas. This year, uh, we've had, uh, we had planned to do some additional activity. Uh, we've had some uh, difficulty getting our joint venture aligned. Uh, so we've been focused on uh, commercialization. Our JV partner in the, uh, in, in the asset uh, is Origin Energy. So I'll move on to our side hustles. Uh, um, we, we saw that uh, we were going to need to participate in the energy transition business. And we have three subsidiaries that uh, are working on that. Uh, uh, 2H Resources, which looks at natural hydrogen, uh, uh, Battery Minerals, Batmin, uh, which is searching for uh, lead zinc deposits in the Canning Basin with some success, and uh, Geovolt, which is uh, embarking on a, uh, on a major uh, CCS pilot program. So 2H Resources, um, there's a lot of additional information on what we're doing with 2H in our uh, main corporate presentation. Uh, hydrogen's been uh, found in lots of wells in the past. Uh, and of course, uh, it was looked at as just a, a byproduct, basically. What do you do with hydrogen apart from put it into an airship? And of course, now it's a uh, very well sought after future fuel. So going back, looking at a lot of the old wells that were drilled, a lot of them had uh, very high levels of hydrogen in them. We picked up uh, a, a very large acreage position uh, in South Australia where there's um, uh, hydrogen wells that have been drilled in the past. And it's also an area that has uh, uh, very good regulation for what we're trying to do in the natural hydrogen space. Um, 
that uh, uh, that's in an early stage, uh, but uh, uh, we're a pioneer in it, and we have a lot of internal expertise to drive this forward. Uh, potentially, there's billions of kilograms of hydrogen recoverable from these uh, from this acreage, and any of you who've followed what the hydrogen market looks like, um, that translates into billions of dollars of resource. So it's, a, it's a, a very, very interesting project. Um, Geovault, uh, the uh, CCS is going to be uh, a, uh, a very important component of trying to get to uh, uh, low carbon activity, particularly for industries that are hard to decarbonize. And there's lots of those. So we've, uh, we've, uh, taking the initiative here to start a project uh, to put together a pilot project in our uh, Carnarvon Basin area. And uh, we've been very fortunate that the uh, Commonwealth Government has uh, offered us a $7 million grant to, uh, to do that work. And uh, that's been matched by our partner in this project, uh, Mineral Resources. So we have a $14 million pilot project that Buru has essentially carried through. And then uh, Batmin, hopefully uh, you like the logo. Um, we, this was basically put together because we kept seeing big thick sections of lead zinc mineralization in our petroleum wells, but they were deep, so well below commercial mining depths. So we thought, well, okay, let's put our geological hat on and go and see if we can find some of this stuff at a shallow depth. So we pegged some areas in concert with uh, a company uh, in the mining business called SEPA Resources. And we're just in the middle of a drilling program for that. Uh, our first two holes have found uh, uh, big thick intersections of sulfides. The second hole in particular had 38 meters of uh, what looked like uh, very high uh, lead and zinc intercepts. So um, this has turned into a pretty substantial side hustle. So sum up, uh, our core oil and gas business is in good shape, making uh, uh, good money out of our, uh, out of our oil production. Uh, we've got a very, very interesting gas discovery and a lot of prospects to follow up in the Canning Basin and also a drilling program in the Carnarvon Basin. And our energy transition businesses have gone from uh, inception to having real value over the last couple of years. So we've got a nice rounded portfolio uh, and we've got lots of activity going on. So thank you very much for your attention. Eric, can you do me a favor? Can you stand about the second step down because I'm so short, maybe the third, and then turn around and face me because I want to get a shot of you for your last ever presentation. I think it would be nice. All right, let's see how we go. And you've got a halo behind your head as well. That's why that Who thought of the Batman um, logo? Because I really like that Batman logo. That was pretty neat, wasn't it? I enjoyed that. And uh, Thomas, down the back there, when you put your hand up, um, 700 people who are now watching from um, our live stream know what the back of your hand looks like. So they can identify you from the back of your hand. But I'm sure they'll look forward to seeing you next year. Okay, as we all know, sometimes it is the success of a project that owes a lot to its location, proximity to markets. ADX Energy is in the right spot at the right time. By virtue of their location, they're in the position to provide much needed energy in Europe as the region grapples with the uh, Russia-Ukraine fallout and all that um, ensuing shortage of a supply of oil and gas. So cooking with gas, the man his team members refer to as the Greek chef has joined us. Yes, that is a reference to his... Um, skills in the kitchen but on this occasion he is here cooking up for ADX Energy. Would you please welcome Ian Chakos. Thank you very much and uh, it's always hard to follow up uh, uh, after Eric and uh, he's very exciting talk from him but uh, sorry <laughs> no, not for much longer but uh, hopefully our assets will uh, do the talking. Uh, it's been a while uh, since energy security has been a major concern 
and the heat is really on, uh, not just for cooking. Um, so uh, we're, we're, what we're seeing differently this time from what we've seen is the past in many of the majors are paralysed between uh, producing oil and gas now, exploration and transition. So I think that opens up some very unique opportunities for a small company like ourselves. There's a disclaimer statement up front. You can read it at your leisure. So <clears throat> ASX is... Uh, uh, an, a, uh, an ASX listed, sorry, ADX is an ASX listed company in Europe. Um, for a while, I think we've been uh, out of sight, but uh, now with what's happening in Europe, I think we're no longer out of mind. Um, we're showing ESG up there front and centre. This is not just, you know, to be a, a good boy. Uh, it's actually, uh, you know, essential or girl. Uh, it's actually essential when you're operating in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, it's not a nice to have, it's actually a have to have for, for us. Uh, banks will, first of all, want to see your balance sheet and your cash flow. The next thing they want to see is your ESG strategy. Uh, we've, we're very fortunate. Uh, we've got a growing reserve base. So we had a, got a nice stable cash flow in our Vienna Basin oil field, but then we've made a recent discovery. And we can now complement that with uh, high impact gas exploration and very complementary uh, renewable opportunities. In our case, our renewable opportunities are not, uh, if you like, sideshows. Uh, they're actually very much front and centre, and we really see them as upcycling our existing asset base. So we operate in multiple new, uh, European jurisdictions, uh, but I have to say right now our focus is uh, very much in Austria. Uh, we're very well established there. We've got the people on the ground. We've got the assets. Uh, we've got a very good database, and very importantly, uh, we've got very good access to infrastructure, which is uh, great uh, when you're uh, an exploration and production company. And it gives us the fastest pathway to cash flow, and uh, we believe that's absolutely critical. Just giving you an asset snapshot, there's really three key elements to our business. Uh, production, we currently produce around 280 barrels a day of long life uh, production in our Vienna Basin assets. We've got about 1.8 million barrels. Uh, our recent discovery, the Anschoff discovery, tested around 130 barrels a day, but we expect to improve on that significantly. Uh, exploration, we've got a massive gas prospect to drill this year. About 800 BCF is our best case estimate, but we've got about 72 million barrels of oil equivalent in a very deep oil and gas portfolio supported by excellent 3D. Uh, over a, a thousand square kilometres acreage. And then our renewable uh, projects uh, include complementary, com sorry, complementary green hydrogen project uh, associated with our Vienna Basin field. Uh, also, we're looking at uh, installing two uh, megawatts of uh, solar power for our own use and putting into the grid. Uh, and then in Upper Austria, we've done feasibility work on a 16 megawatt geothermal project. So I think uh, we're, we're very well placed uh, for Europe's gas crisis, uh, as well as future transition. Uh, I don't know how many of you watch, uh, have you been paying attention, but uh, uh, it's a comedy I like. Unfortunately, uh, the European gas price is uh, uh, not a comedy. Uh, it's actually a pretty difficult situation. Uh, but it's not just the Ukraine uh, invasion that caused this. It actually started in 2021, where you can see uh, gas prices started to ramp up already then up to nearly 100 megawatt, uh, sorry, 100 euro megawatt hour, which is about three times uh, the highest gas prices you'd see in winter. Now we're looking at a situation where uh, gas prices are absolutely eye-watering. Uh, in, in August, we saw about 420 BOE uh, uh, per barrel uh, oil equivalent gas price. Uh, but when you look at the futures curve, you can also see that gas prices over the next five years are at about 100 euro megawatt hour. That equates to about uh, 30 US uh, per MCF, about 10 times the US gas price. So I think what the market sees is uh, th this is not a, a, you know, a problem that we're going to solve quickly. Uh, LNG will help, but that will take time. So, um, you know, we're, we're, when you look at, you know, a BCF of gas uh, at, that's virtually worth 100 million, uh, that is, you know, rather worrying. Okay, um, so uh, you might ask, well, what's an Aussie battler doing in Austria? Well, we're not there for, for the skiing. Uh, we're really filling the void that the majors have left behind. 
uh, we bought assets from a company called ROG, which was previously a consortium of Mobile and Shell. They got out of the business. They were taken out by four gas utilities. And after spending about 100 million euros on 3D seismic and a, a success rate of around 50% uh, onshore uh, in Upper Austria, uh, they decided to give the game away. And they walked out and we've been lucky enough to walk in. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a very good position for us to be in. Uh, you know, we're in a tiny country. It's in the heart of Europe. We've got excellent infrastructure that we've negotiated access terms to. And it's a country that surprisingly uh, produced over a billion barrels of oil and three TCF of gas. So it shouldn't be out of mind. Uh, but <laughs> we drilled the only exploration well in 2021. It was a discovery. And, and obviously that also shows where the industry has been uh, in Europe, where uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, Europe is now suffering a hangover due to getting drunk on uh, Russian gas for, for decades. So unfortunately, Europeans, other than the Norwegians probably, have not really been exploring. And uh, that's the reason we are where we are today. So um, just looking at our Vienna Basin oil and gas fields, uh, uh, what you see there is a, a beautiful oil field that's very well maintained. It's been producing for over 50 years. Uh, it produces long life oil. Uh, at around 280 barrels a day. We, we haven't seen any decline in the field since we bought it two years ago, but um, it's not really an oil and gas field. What it, you were seeing there is a future energy park because uh, what we also have there is uh, um, only kilom uh, 70 kilometres from Vienna, which wants to be a green energy hub. Uh, we've got 13 uh, hectares plus of land, which we own. Uh, we've got very good fiscal terms, but we also have depleted gas reservoirs. Uh, we've also got uh, some of the biggest wind parks uh, in Austria surrounding us. And we also have access to the gas pipeline network that we currently feed into. Uh, and as of July of this year, uh, you've been able to put up to 10% hydrogen into the gas pipeline network. So we've got all the ingredients we need uh, for hydrogen storage. Uh, and we also are looking to install a solar farm because uh, we've got about 24 pump jacks and we want to actually supply some of that power with, with green energy uh, and also put uh, power into the grid. So what we're hoping to create there is not a depleting oil field, uh, but if you like a transition poster child. So um, uh, we're not just in the Vienna Basin. What you see there is a map of uh, of Upper Austria, uh, we're on the on the side closest to Germany uh, in the Molas Basin, and uh, what's significant about this is uh, we've been operating on around three and a half thousand square kilometres of 3D seismic, which was acquired by ROG. When they walked out of the basin, uh, they uh, gave us access to this uh, seismic database and about a hundred wells which has enabled us to walk in and within 12 months uh, walk in, uh, develop a portfolio of drilling prospects, uh, drill our first well, have an oil discovery, and in October we'll be producing. Now I can tell you there's nowhere on the planet that you can do that uh, other than maybe the US. The only difference here is we're the, we're the only explorer in the basin, which is just ridiculous. Uh, but anyway, it is what it is, and we hope to take advantage of it. But it's it's not just, um, uh, if you like, the Anchoff oil discovery. We're also blessed, uh, as I said, with a very deep uh, portfolio of prospects, and uh, we plan to get drilling those. Uh, and we also have a, a real game-changing uh, potential gas opportunity in the uh, Calcarinus Alps uh, that you'll hear a lot more about in the uh, next uh, six to 12 months. So Anchoff, um, Anchoff was a, a very good uh, discovery for us. Uh, obviously, it's very nice to, to walk into a new country and then quickly have a discovery with your first exploration well. Uh, we drilled the uh, well right at the crest of the structure. Uh, basically, the, 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 the first well we drilled has validated a structure that's around 25 square kilometres. Now, obviously, we, we've just pinpricked the very top of this thing, uh, but we were able to test uh, 130 barrels a day. Uh, and uh, more importantly, uh, under the Austrian jurisdiction, we're actually able to get into an early production system, uh, which will be able to deliver cash flow uh, 
uh, as of uh, next month. And uh, what that'll mean for us is about a, you know, 30% increase uh, in revenues and production. Uh, we've got access to infrastructure. Uh, it's Brent equivalent oil. And uh, what we're planning to do is uh, hopefully book some reserves around that, uh, which will also help our reserve position. Uh, but we're also looking at drilling uh, two wells uh, from the same location. The Anshoff 3 well was uh, actually drilled on a location um, with uh, three well slots. Uh, we're a bit crazy. We drilled the, the third well slot first, but we did that because it was furthest away from a forest. And uh, while we got the opportunity to cut down some of the forest, uh, it, we were able to move forward and, and drill the well. So that's all good. But what's more important is as we go off the structure, you can see the, the, what we, we see prognosed based on seismic and also, um, if you like, the um, uh, offset wells uh, is a much greater thickening of the Eocene sandstones, which uh, should deliver much higher productivity. And uh, what we're anticipating in the next 12 to 18 months, uh, we'll be able to get production rates up from about 100 barrels a day up to around 1,000 barrels a day with uh, that drilling. All right, well, Chow. Um, you know, uh, very well, Chow is a very exciting opportunity for for ADX. So we basically picked up where IMV left off in 1989. Uh, what's unusual about this compared to the rest of the portfolio is there's no state of the art 3D, but what we do have is excellent surface geology. Uh, we've got the st state of the art structural modelling uh, section balancing. Any of you have looked at places like Kurdistan would would know what that's all about. Uh, but more importantly, we're only three kilometres away uh, from about a 400 metre gas column that was discovered by OMV in 1989 and tested, and it had sweet gas with over 30 barrels per million standard cubic feet of condensate. The, the well is cheap to drill. It's about 1,100 metres, uh, we anticipate, to top reservoir. Uh, and uh, the obviously the opportunity is huge with... Uh, uh, a BCF equivalent of 800 BCF. And as you remember, one BCF right now is worth uh, about 100 million uh, US. We don't need that. Uh, we could be very happy with about a tenth of that, uh, but if uh, if this works. Uh, so we're, we're very excited about this. It's analogous to some of the major discoveries in Kurdistan and Italy and, and PNG. And uh, we hope to be drilling this uh, within the next nine months. All right, well, what you see here is a pretty complex flow chart. <laughs> Essentially, what we're looking to do is, as I mentioned earlier, we've got depleted reservoirs uh, in, um, the, in our Vienna Basin assets. Uh, what we're looking to do is basically take power from the surrounding um, uh, uh, wind parks, uh, inject hydrogen into these reservoirs and prove up their capability uh, for hydrogen storage because the hydrogen economy is absolutely going to need uh, storage. Without storage, it's going to be very hard to develop uh, economic uh, hydrogen uh, in any jurisdiction. And, and we're right on the axis of, uh, if you like, the, the hydrogen network there. Uh, I'll let you look at this at your own pace uh, on our website. Uh, we were also developing a, uh, and maturing a geothermal project in Upper Austria. Uh, right next to Bavaria, where the industry is much more mature. And then finally, uh, this is our activity chart. Now, obviously, it looks pretty complicated. Uh, there's a lot going on, uh, but really the sun's shining and we're making hay. Uh, we'll be drilling at least three wells, two Anschoff uh, appraisal wells, development wells, and the, the giant Welchow gas prospect. But based on the, you know, the the uh, so the, the very strong support we're getting on our farm out program, uh, I anticipate we'll probably be drilling at least another two gas wells in the coming 12 to 18 months. So it's an exceptional program, uh, and please watch this space. Uh, you can see a lot more of this on on our website. All the best. Thank you very much. And Jagos, I think you did very very well. Thank you very much, sir. Right. We've got three presentations to go before lunch to whet your appetite with. Uh, a little bit about this next company or this next uh, group and who's investing it. There's, um, the general public actually holds 52% stake in our next presenter. That's pretty substantial. Um, 
suggesting it's a fairly popular stock. Institutional investors have got a fair amount of stake in this group as well as Empire Energy Group. Um, so I suppose the question is, have they got it right? Is this something that we would like to translate our dollars into? This fellow here is Alex Alexander. Excuse me, she's the full name your parents gave to you, Alexander Underwood. He's the MD. He's also spent a couple of years working with the Commonwealth Bank, haven't you, in resources, Macquarie as well. So you've got a bit of a passion for this particular field and he's translated. Now he's out there doing it himself in the field. So let's hear what he has to say um, about this group and whether it will have an impact on whether you put it into your portfolio. Would you please make Alexander very welcome? Thank you very much. And I, I hope we've got it right because I've put quite a bit of my own money into the company. But anyway, um, so yeah, Empire Energy, we uh, have a very large position in the Beedaloo sub basin. The Beedaloo is the third largest shale gas deposit on earth. Uh, and uh, as Mr. Beedaloo, Dave Close, was telling us yesterday, tens of TCF of recoverable resource, what we are all focused on as an industry right now is demonstrating that uh, these enormous uh, volumes of gas can be commercially extracted. And at this relatively early stage in the appraisal phase of the basin, uh, the signs so far from a number of wells that have recently been drilled are looking highly encouraging. Uh, we're listed on the ASX, our market cap's a couple of hundred million dollars. Uh, we've got about $38 million cash in the bank uh, and a, a very high quality uh, shareholder register, in my opinion. So Paul Fudge is our largest shareholder of Pangaea Resources fame, a, a very successful unconventional gas investor from the uh, Queensland coal seam methane days. Dale Elphinstone is our second largest shareholder. Uh, Dale, in my opinion, is one of the great Australians. He uh, has built a very successful manufacturing business out of Tasmania. Dale sat on the board of Queensland Gas for nine years from the very early days. So he really understands the way that um, commercialising unconventional gas projects can create enormous value. Um, Brian Sheffield is a uh, very successful US oil and gas figure. He has invested in a number of small companies in this basin, including Tambor and Resources, Falcon Oil and Gas, who are Origins JV partner, and us. Um, Brian uh, founded a company in the Permian Basin in West Texas called uh, Parsley Energy and, and sold that about 18 months ago for four and a half billion US dollars. And uh, he sees the potential of the Beedaloo. Um, We also enjoy the support of Macquarie Bank, where I worked for about 10 years, and it's, it's good to see some of our Macquarie Bank friends here today. Uh, and, and critically, our board have invested heavily in the company with our own capital, which I think is really important in terms of aligning interests. Uh, so uh, Dave mentioned a bit about the Beedaloo yesterday, and I thought I'd just provide a bit more detail. So, you know, the, the Beedaloo is demonstrably Australia's largest undeveloped gas resource. Um, there are a number of stacked shale gas plays within the Beedaloo, uh, there's a play called the Kyala Formation, but it's the Vel Kerry Formation that we are all very focused on. And within the Vel Kerry, there are four stacked pays. The, the A shale, the intra AB or lower B as some call it, the B shale and the C shale. The B shale alone has over 500 trillion cubic feet of gas in place. So these are truly enormous uh, resource numbers. You know, clearly we're not going to recover all of that gas, but if we can if we, if we can recover even a small fraction of it, um, this basin can have a, a material impact on energy security, not just for Australia, but also for the broader region. And in, a, in, a, in another slide to come, I will show you the connections into uh, markets that will help make this dream a reality. Uh, in terms of Empire's resource base, we have a P50 prospective resource uh, booked by Netherlands Saul and Associates of 43 TCF of gas and 800 million barrels of liquids. Uh, and we've converted over half a TCF of gas to 2C contingent resource uh, with a very small number of wells drilled so far. So we're really just getting started on that journey. Uh, and as I mentioned, our, our focus is to convert resource not only from pers perspective to contingent, but also to demonstrate the commercial viability of the project and book reserves. Um, so we've got a huge footprint. It's 29 million acres. And um, 
yeah, when I when I recently met Brian Sheffield, he he said that we should put on our slides that you know this represents about seven dollars an acre because it's they're just mind-bogglingly large uh, acreage areas compared to the US plays. Um, we have owned the areas in orange uh, to the east and north since 2011. We were one of the first entrants into this play, having uh, previously owned shale gas properties in America that we sold at a substantial profit a number of years ago. And about 12 or 18 months ago, we acquired Pangaea's properties on the western side of the basin. The other major and active players in the basin are uh, Origin Energy, uh, Santos, and also Tamboran. Um, Origin drilled its first horizontal well back in 2015. That well, um, as Dave was mentioning yesterday, uh, produced about 1.1 million cubic feet a day from only four or five frac stages. Santos, uh, with their JV partner Tamboran, have just had some really encouraging results from two fracked horizontal wells. Uh, I'll soon step you through the results of our first horizontal Carpentaria 2H. And also uh, Tamboran will soon be drilling their first uh, horizontal well, and we, we wish them all the very best of luck. Um, again, just to put these resources into perspective, obviously we are comparing prospective resource bases here with um, reserves and uh, contingent resources. So it's not an apples for apples comparison. But, you know, I think it's it's helpful for people who invested in the coal seam methane industry uh, a decade or so ago to, to see um, the resource potential of this play. And, and it is truly an enormous resource. Uh, fracking is considered by some, you know, less informed people as a bit of a dirty word. And um, what's critical in terms of our social licence to operate as an industry in the Beedaloo Basin is that we have bipartisan support by, at both the Northern Territory government level and also the federal government level. Uh, in 2018, um, at the, the, there was a two-year moratorium on fracking in the Northern Territory, which came to an end. It was an incredibly detailed and broad review of all of the risks and benefits associated with fracking. Uh, it was independent of government. There were lots of uh, scientific experts that contributed. All of the various people of the Northern Territory who wanted to contribute were given the opportunity to do so. And uh, the final report of that inquiry found that fracking could be done safely if adequately regulated, and, and the regulations are now in their final stages of being put into place. Uh, the former federal government uh, recognised that there was a gas shortage coming, and so they provided capital support under the Beedaloo Cooperative Drilling Program. We were the first company to receive grant funding under that program, which offset 25% uh, of the cost of up to three wells. And we've drilled one of them and we'll be drilling the next two later this year. Uh, and Tamboran also has received funding. Uh, critically, we have continued to receive that grant funding under the new government. Um, and also the new government has committed one and a half billion dollars uh, to the development of what is called the Darwin Middle Arm Sustainable Development Precinct. And essentially, this will involve um, building LNG infrastructure in Darwin, but also um, or complementing existing infrastructure, but also making Darwin a major uh, carbon sequestration hub. Um, in terms of what we've been doing as a company, we drilled, we shot our first seismic program back in 2019. We drilled our first vertical well, Carpentaria One. Thereafter, we did a four-stage frack in that vertical well, and we got around 350,000 cubic feet a day. Uh, as expected, the B shale was the most prolific producer of those um, four zones. And so then late last year, we drilled our first horizontal well, Carpentaria 2H. The uh, challenge we set for our drillers was to get at least a one kilometre horizontal section and they got to 1.35. And we recently carried out a 21 stage frack on that well. Um, it was quite a sort of an R&D type frack in that we tried different fluid systems, uh, different perforation designs, and we've run chemicals traces across that horizontal well bore, which we haven't seen the results of yet, um, but it's about optimising fracking. And if you look at the US experience, um, the increases in productivity over the years, which continue to this day after thousands and thousands of wells, have all been about gradually optimising frac design. Um, 
irrespective of the fact that this was a, an R&D type, well, we were really excited about these results because they're getting quite close to economic thresholds already. And as we analyse the results of this well, we will then be adjusting our frack design into the next well and we'll be fracking uh, in December. I'm aware that I'm nearly out of time, so I'll just quickly touch on um, path to market. So there is already an existing pipeline through the basin that can take about 25 terajoules a day. We've signed an MOU with Power Water Corporation who owns that pipe. Um, they are very keen to be buying more gas because the NT is structurally short right now. Uh, the longer term plan that we envisage is under an MOU with APA Group, which would involve the construction of large pipelines to both the, to the north to Darwin to complement LNG export and to Australia's east coast. So that's exactly my time. So I might stop there. You're on fire. Well done. Would you put your hands together, please? Thank you. Yeah. I didn't want to say that you guys had about 16%. I thought I'd let you go for it there. But yeah, interesting. Thank you very much for that talk. Now, look, we continue to hear about that shortage of oil and gas in Europe. Britain, obviously, is in the same boat. And the issues for them of sovereignty, ownership over oil and gas supply is a really big topic. And they're about to go into their winter. And as they say, you can have all your net zero plans you like. But when you want to switch that switch on and get warm and have some hot water, et cetera, you want it there and then. And uh, you know, you need to find a solution. So Hartshead Resources is being looked towards to provide said solution. Mr. Chris Lewis is Managing Director. I have not really had a chance to do a proper catch up with him. So I am as interested as yourselves in hearing this talk firsthand. Would you please make him very welcome. Chris Lewis on behalf of Hartshead Resources. Wow, these lights are bright. Um, thanks for staying around before lunch. Um, I'll try and keep this painless. Um, I just need to work out how to move through my slides. Which button do I need? The green button. Oh, easy. Okay. Um, I won't labour too much on our disclaimers and forward-looking statements. They're all available from the presentation off the website. What I will do is give you an introduction to who Hartshead Resources are. Um, as uh, well pointed out, the, the UK is in the middle of not just a, a gas crisis, but an energy crisis that's throughout Europe. Hartford Resources are developing gas fields in the Southern Gas Basin in the North Sea to provide um, gas into the UK energy system. Uh, we own a single license, 100%, that's license P2607 in the Southern North Sea. It contains five contiguous offshore blocks and within those blocks, we have multiple opportunities for fields to be redeveloped uh, and exploration opportunities. Our phase one is two fields, both have historic production from single wells. Those single wells produced roughly in aggregate 60 BCF of gas, and we have about 600 BCF of gas in place. So our phase one represents 2P reserves of about 300 BCF of gas to be recovered. Our phase two follows on from phase one. It's uh, also two fields to be redeveloped, also with historic production. That's another 140 BCF of gas to be recovered. And then we have a, an exploration portfolio of about 340 BCF of gas. So if you count our reserves, contingent resources and prospective resources in aggregate, we have nearly 800, 800 BCF of gas of resources to be recovered, which is a, a significant resource base when you're starting to look at the energy requirement in the UK going forwards. And particularly in the UK, we are very dependent on imports. We need more indigenous gas and, and Hearts had hoped to play our part in providing that. Um, we've, we received the, the license P2607 at the beginning of 2021. We have spent the last 18 months assembling a, a very high quality project delivery team. Um, I'll go on to talk a little bit about the project and what we've achieved, but we have a very experienced development manager who's delivered over a dozen small gas field developments in the Southern Gas Basin. We have a commercial manager who's negotiated uh, gas transportation and off-taking agreements in the Southern Gas Basin. Uh, the last one he did was with Shell. We have a subsurface manager who has executed very similar developments to ours in the Southern Gas Basin. So we have a, a team of people in the UK that have been there, seen this and done it before. And that's very important in terms of delivering, particularly our, our phase one development plan. You can see there 
that, that we have uh, an incredible resource base, but you can also see that we are a, a critical part, not just of the UK's energy security strategy, but also the energy transition. Uh, our gas will be going into the Bacton uh, reception and processing terminal in the UK. Uh, and the UK government have spent the last two years looking at, at that area becoming the Bacton Energy Hub, a centre for uh, offshore wind, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, and offshore CCS. And we see potentially our gas being delivered into Bacton as being a very important part of the energy transition and potentially fuel stock to blue hydrogen. So a great resource base, a great team, uh, a great position to be in, in an incredible market. So we think right place, right time. There we go. And talking about the gas market, I, I think you will probably know what's going on in on Saturday evening. I turned on the TV and there are articles on the Australian news about UK gas prices. It's pretty phenomenal. Um, even before the, the terrible events in Ukraine, we saw gas prices start to spike and you can see some of the gas price, price spikes on that graph. This is really to do with um, stability of supply to gas to Europe, um, very, very dependent on imports, not just Russia, but LNG, um, Qatari gas, uh, gas from Norway. Um, the, 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 the issues with getting hold of those exports and the vulnerability of the energy system has really started to push prices up before the invasion of Ukraine. Obviously, invasion of Ukraine has had a terrible effect on the gas markets, but this is going to be a structural shift in energy pricing in Europe, because countries in Europe now have to start looking at having sovereign control over their energy security and not offshoring that to Russia or Qatar or America or anyone else. And we need to build our own internal energy systems in the UK and in Europe that can provide us with the energy we need. And that will inevitably probably mean more expensive energy, uh, but we need to make those investments. We see a structural change in gas prices. And I've got to be honest, I don't want to see uh, five pounds a therm long term. Um, I think one pound a therm is, is where we'll probably end up. Um, if you think about our phase one project, 300 BCF of gas is three billion therms, roughly. So at one pound a therm, the revenue from our phase one will be about three billion pounds. So incredibly valuable project in uh, a very interesting gas market. Sorry, button's not working. Uh -uh. I'm pressing it and nothing's happening. It is this one, isn't it? Oh, there we go. Why don't you just stay here and it obviously makes it work. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, so this is our, our license footprint. Um, you can see where our phase one is. It's uh, the two red blobs, the Anning and Somerville gas fields. Uh, as I said, both of those fields have had historic production. So we have very little subsurface uncertainty. Uh, between the two fields, there are seven well penetrations. Four of those wells have over, over 200 foot of core through the reservoir. We understand the reservoir very well. Uh, they both have good 3D seismic data coverage. So we understand the size of the accumulations very well. Uh, and they both have historic production and well tests. So we can build high confidence, static and dynamic models. We can history match those models. And then we can really work out how we're going to develop these fields. Um, one of the questions I often get is why haven't these fields been developed before? Well, they were owned by a super major. Um, in terms of materiality of resources, probably not that significant, and they are slightly lower permeability than the easier fields around us. But we are going into these fields deploying horizontal extended reach multi-frac wells. We have an analog field next door to us called Clipper South, where that has been deployed successfully. And our subsurface manager was the lead development manager of Clipper South. So we're taking proven technology deployed in the basin with identical reservoirs to produce from our phase one area. You can see phase two further up to the north, that's 140 BCF again, two fields that have multiple well penetrations, 3D seismic data coverage, uh, um, well tests uh, and, and, and well logs. And we understand these fields, we need to do a little bit more subsurface on uh, work on these fields. They'll go into field development planning later this year. And then 
a really interesting portfolio of exploration opportunities. And one thing that's really worth focusing on is when we put our phase one infrastructure in place, a lot of these exploration opportunities become infrastructure led exploration. These can be drilled, tied back and monetized very, very quickly. We have four prospects near our phase one. In aggregate, they represent an additional 200 BCF of gas. Uh, two can be drilled from our phase one platforms. The other two can be tied back subsea. So we can bring the, these on as part of our phase one development very, very rapidly. So potentially our phase one could transform quite quickly into half a TCF of gas in a success case with these four exploration prospects. You might have to come and stand over here again. <laughs> oh, there we go. So what have we done with the assets that we got? And we, we were awarded these through the 32nd licensing round in the UK. We received the license award uh, provisionally in September of 2020 and got the final paperwork in January of 2021. And we've spent the last 18 months really focused on delivering phase one. Um, when, we, when we set out, we said we'd do a number of things by the first half of this year. That was identify our optimum development concept. So frac placement, well trajectories, um, facilities infrastructure, pipelines, offtake route. We've done all that. We submitted our concept select report to the UK government in May of this year, and we got it approved within six weeks. Now, that's quite remarkable. I have seen companies take over 12 months to get a concept select report approved. And I think that speaks volumes to the requirement for the UK regulator to start making approvals more efficient. We need to get these gas fields on stream as fast as possible. Nobody wants to take 12 months getting through an approvals process for a development concept. So we submitted that and got approval within six weeks. That development concept we also put in front of our reserves auditor. Uh, when we started with the license, we our phase one was 220 BCF of 2C contingent resources. Uh, following evaluation from our auditor, where we could show them the entire development concept from the reservoir to a sales point, we now have 300 BCF of 2P reserves. Uh, our, our reserves auditor came back and said, as far as they're concerned, that our phase one is justified for development and has a 100% chance of being developed. So this project is happening and this project is real. What we also delivered was an offtake route. Um, one of the things that the previous owner operator did was removed a lot of the infrastructure in place. We are surrounded by a lot of very usable infrastructure owned by other owner operator groups. We have identified a, a single gas transportation and processing route that will take our gas down to the Backton terminal. Um, and so we are now in an engineering study agreement with Shell to define the engineering around a tie-in with the Shell infrastructure and Shell will transport and process our gas for us down to a sales point in the UK. We will continue to own the molecules. We'll be a customer of Shell's. They will look after our molecules and we'll pay them uh, a tariff on top of our gas for that transportation. We've been working with Shell for about 12 months to achieve this. Uh, and that's something we were very pleased to announce quite recently. So everything we said we would do at the beginning of last year, we have done. And we've also seen a significant increase in the resource volumes as part of our phase one. What do we do next? Um, I think one of the key things that we've just started to look at, and we, we started a process at the end of June, is start to, I guess, fill in the last part of the puzzle for our phase one. So we have a development plan, we have an offtake route, we know how to get our molecules to market. We need the development capital to do that. So we've launched a divestment process. We're looking to secure a, an industry partner to buy a, a significant stake in our phase one development. And that divestment should allow us to put in place the majority of our required development capital. And just to talk round numbers, um, we've got a company very close to us, Independent Oil and Gas, who are now in production, but in 2019, we're in a very similar position to we are in today. Uh, they went through a, a partial divestment process they sold 50% of a small gas development project to a company called Cal Energy, who are funded by Berkshire Hathaway, so Warren Buffett. And they achieved a, a sale multiple of roughly three US dollars per barrel of oil equivalent. And that was when 
gas was trading at about 40 pence per therm. We all saw the graph earlier. Uh, gas, I think on Monday or yesterday, was about five pounds a therm. We see long-term gas pricing at being 80 pence or a pound a therm. So very different gas price environment when IOG achieved $3 per barrel of oil equivalent. We believe we're, we're, we're targeting roughly $5 per barrel of oil equivalent. And what does that mean for a, a divestment on phase one? Our phase one is roughly 50 million barrels of oil equivalent. If we sell down 50% of that, that's 25 million barrels of oil equivalent. That's $125 million. That will get us to first gas on our phase one development. So the di partial divestment process we have underway right now is very important in terms of putting the first tranche of our development capital in place. What it also means is we will have an industry view on the value of our asset. We currently trade around about on market an implied value of roughly one US dollar per BOE. And we're talking about industry looking at this and saying it's worth five. So we see not only the, the transaction that we're looking to achieve as allowing us to put our development capital in place, but a significant re-rate of the valuation of the asset and the share price on market. We're looking to conclude that transaction towards the end of this year. Um, certainly, we're very busy on it at the moment. We have a good number of companies in the data room, and that's really our focus for the next six months. Um, we're also focused on the next steps of engineering and environmental work. We've been out to the market looking at quotes for front-end engineering and design and for environmental surveys. That will lead us to submit our FD field development plan early next year and take final investment decision on our phase one middle of next year. That sees us putting platforms in place in the North Sea in summer of 2024 and first gas towards the end of 2024. It's a very near-term gas for the UK gas market. And I think because of that, we've got a very, very active data room. Um, I could talk all day about this. Uh, I'm conscious I've got about two minutes left. Um, I'm not sure I'm gonna say much more because I like to leave a bit of time for questions, but I think just what's worth pointing out is what our offtake route looks like. So this is a cartoon of our development plan. You can see two minimum facility wellhead platforms. They are ultra minimum um, facility. So we have very low power requirements on platform wind, on platform solar. And then that goes through the shell network down to the Bacton uh, reception facility. So you can see this is a very real, very low emissions, very low impact, very high value project that is happening now and delivering first gas in 2024. And I think I'll leave it there. You got 35 seconds. Is there a 30 second question out there for your opportunity to invest in Britain? Anyone? I'll race down with the microphone. Do you want to have a private conversation with Christopher later? Yes? Here it's private conversations, Chris. Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah? Thank you very much, everyone. Good on you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for coming to present. Interesting, isn't it? Right. Do you know excess gas at the moment on the East Coast can sell for around, I think it's 41, 40, $40 a gigajoule, I think I was looking at. And last year, so this time last year, it was $6.50 to $7.50. Um, so it's a big, massive jump. And with that in mind, I'd like to welcome up to the stage our last presenter in this segment, Cooper Energy. They're hyper-focused, particularly market at the moment on the East Coast. 2022 has been a transformational year for them. They've completed a rather large shopping excursion, added a nice little bit to their, their basket. There's a lot of opportunity for growth. This fellow here is David Maxwell. He is winner of the John Duran Award, which is associated with this conference. And he's joining us in his role as Managing Director of Cooper Energy. Were you actually here yesterday? Because I got around to see most people, but I didn't see you. All right. So our last speaker yesterday was another David from Argonaut, you may know well, and we put the question to him at the end, didn't we? We said, who would you invest in out of the presenters that were here? He actually said nice things about you. I might buy him a beer later. Thank That's you. right. Well, he's convinced. If you were here last night, he would have bought you a bit free. But um, yes, he's convinced, so convince us. Would you please make him very welcome, everyone? Thanks. Thanks very much. And I'm really conscious that I stand um, between yourselves and lunch. And if you come from the Eastern States, probably between yourselves and a rather large afternoon tea. Um, 
Cooper Energy's business and strategy is focused, uh, as per the introduction, very much on cost competitive gas supply to South East Australia. And we focus in on the domestic market. And it's been this way for the last 10 years. That's been our focus. And it's not an accident. And you can start to see the benefits of uh, that strategy and the reasons why we've been doing what we've been doing over the last 10 years. I'm going to illustrate how we operate and optimize across our two gas hubs, which are located close to where gas is needed at a time when supply is very tight and how we are going about further growing the business. But firstly, before I get into the presentation, I, I do want to acknowledge for our two years for, for Cooper Energy with the issues that we've had to manage as a result of APA's management of the Orbos gas plant. But now, by far the bulk of that is behind us, and I'm going to illustrate to you the strength of the position that we now find ourselves in. The standard disclaimer, you're fast readers, so we'll move on. Firstly, to set the scene, and some of this will be familiar to you, but there's, it's not just all about the hydrocarbons in the ground in the market. The emerging themes our, in, our energy industry is experienced and, and are being discussed every day in the media are there on the left-hand side. The key elements of a successful gas business, you've got to have the resource, you've got to have the infrastructure, You've got to have the market available, and most importantly, you've got to have relationships. And these are the relationships with a multiple uh, number of uh, people, number of groups, stakeholders, investors, financiers, customers, regulators. And it's the combination of all four that are required for a successful business. And on the right-hand side, there's an assessment of how Cooper Energy measures up. And that's a position that we've put together over the last, two, over the last 10 years. Southeast Australia has a domestic gas shortage. Energy markets are volatile and increasingly unpredictable. Geopolitical tensions are ever present and there is a global imperative to reduce emissions and transition to new energy. And ESG has rapidly become the gatekeeper to how we do business and access debt and equity capital, which is vital for our business. These themes are shaping what's needed So how does Cooper Energy go about it? Gas supply in Southeast Australia is tight and the outlook is it's going to get even tighter. 40% of the forecast supply is from undeveloped reserves. That's the light green that you see on this chart. If capital for these forecast projects is not deployed, the supply gap is larger. As a result, we've seen in Victoria and Sydney, spot gas prices increased significantly over the last 12 months. And as shown in the chart on the right, they were in the $40 range. As at today, Victoria is $18.11 in the spot market per gigajoule and Sydney $22. And that was the, they were this morning's prices. The international LNG price is having an increasing influence on gas prices in Eastern Australia. That's something that the ACCC has identified and they acknowledge. And as much as they don't like it, they do also accept it. And that linkage is now setting the benchmark for gas prices in the future. The outlook is, a, is that long-term take or pay supply contracts, and these are take or pay contracts that are being negotiated now for supply in the next couple of years and typically for five, six, seven, eight years term, the outlook is for those prices to be in the mid-teens per gigajoule. This is a market signal that makes Cooper Energy's near-term growth opportunities even more attractive. And you add to this, we've also got price reviews in our existing contracts, our existing foundation take or pay contracts. Some interesting trends are becoming clear in the national electricity market. There's been a reduction in coal-fired generation. We read a lot about that. And this has led to increased gas for power generation to fill the supply gap, especially when there's little wind and the sun's not shining. A consequence of the changes in the fuel mix for power generation is that in June, the June quarter of this year, the CO2 emissions in the NEM were the lowest ever reported for a quarter. 
This reinforces the importance of gas and renewables working together to decarbonize the electricity sector. Coal generation in the NEM still accounts for a roughly two thirds, and here I'm talking about Eastern Australia, two thirds of total generation. In gas equivalent terms, that's about a thousand terajoules a year. Sorry, that's about a thousand petajoules a year. So how is Cooper Energy working this opportunity? Our activities and projects over the last three, three years have completely transformed our business. We now operate all aspects of two integrated hubs in the Otway Basin around the Athena gas plant and in the Gippsland Basin around what we've named the Orbos gas processing plant. This is from the offshore to the processing plants and then delivering the gas into the pipeline network. This, together with the relationships that are in place, and that's what I talked about at the start, enables us to optimize across these two hubs to maximize the benefits for our customers, our financiers, and obviously our shareholders. And that's one of the key elements for a successful and growing gas business. Wood McKenzie has illustrated, and this is their view of commercial reserves, it's not our view in Southeast Australia, their view of commercial reserves in Southeast Australia. And that's illustrated there on the left-hand side in a series of boxes. The Cooper Energy Reserves are well positioned relative to others in terms of location, cost, and exposure to the spot price. Cooper Energy is really the pure play in Eastern Australia domestic gas. And it's worth noting that Wood Mackenzie themselves have predicted there's still another 5,000 petajoules of commercial reserves remaining in the southern offshore basins. And here we're mainly talking about the Otway and the Gippsland. And that's equivalent to about 10 years of demand. The recently developed fields and the fields of the future are typically going to be smaller than those of the past. But they're very cost effective and they generate very strong cash flows. And the Sol project is a great example of this. On the right hand side, we compare the average realized gas price for ourselves, that's the green bars with two of our peers or our competitors who are the pink bars supplying gas into Southeastern Australia. This highlights our upside gas price leverage. A quick snapshot on the recent Cooper Energy performance. This time 12 months ago, or in fact 13 months ago, we set ourselves a series of imperatives for the 2002, 2022 financial year. That's what we focused on and we delivered on every one of them. These imperatives address the operational and financial areas required to embed a firm foundation built around our two gas hubs to deliver the medium and long-term value with certainty. The graph on the right-hand side illustrates the steady improvement quarter by quarter of the Orbos gas processing plant at the same time as the increase in the average gas price received for our sole gas sales. This resulted in a significant step up in our underlying EBIT DAX last year to over 80 million by the end of FY22. For your information today, Orbost is processing at 64 terajoules and the plan is to take that to 68 terajoules in the next month, in the next week. Um, and still have every three weeks one of the absorbers down for a clean, at which point the rate drops down to 40. So we are getting up towards that nameplate uh, capacity. You put that together with what we're producing through Athena, and we're operating around about 100 terajoules a day into the gas market of southeastern Australia. In the Otway Basin, and specifically the offshore Otway Basin, and around the Athena gas plant, we're working in three key areas. We're looking to increase the production and the cash margin generated from the existing wells, existing infrastructure, and the, exist and the Athena gas plant. The second area, we're progressing the next step up in production of what we refer to as the Otway Phase 3 or OP3D development. And our plans and work schedule are based on this being online before the winter of 2025. And at that point, the rate through, a, through Athena will go up to around 70 terajoules a day. And to put some numbers around it, that's an operating cost of about $2. And you 
work out the numbers off the mid-teen prices that I worked that I that I mentioned earlier. And the third area on the back of OP3D is rapidly adding further production to pro, further production to process at Athena. We have numerous drill-ready prospects available. These are all amplitude supported, which, as many of you will know, means that they're really low risk. In the Gippsland, similarly, we're building our business around the Orbos gas plant, which is now owned 100% by Cooper Energy. And the three areas that we're focusing on here are, firstly, working with APA to transfer the major hazard facility license so the plant operations then come under Cooper Energy Management. Increase in the second area is increasing the Orbos gas processing rate with the existing kit that's in place. When I say increasing, we've already talked about 64 to 68, it's getting up and over 68. And the third area is advancing the next wave of development of our own gas resources and assessing the economic viability of also processing others gas resources through our through our Orbos gas plant. Across both the Otway and the Gippsland assets, we have a portfolio now of production, growth in production, development and exploration opportunities to bring well over a TCF or circa a thousand petajoules of new resource to the market. These resources are fully integrated, all operated by Cooper Energy at a time when the market needs more gas and gas prices are increasing. And for our shareholders, it generates a pile of cash. We thank our shareholders, customers, and banks for their resilience and sustained support. To illustrate, here is a profile of our production outlook, and we'll call this, we call this our growth staircase. The cash flow profile is even more compelling. As gas prices increase, and our, and our operating costs decline, as effectively most of them are fixed costs, as the volumes increase. Just to put some numbers around it, at the moment, we're just shy of 10,000 BOEs a day, which is around 3.4 million barrels of oil equivalent uh, a year. Over the next five, six years, that gets up to 10 million, 10 million barrels of oil equivalent per year, or around 30,000 BOEs a day. The combination of all that we have delivered and achieved in FY22 is a growing foundation cash flow, which enables the progress and delivery of the high value growth opportunities within the existing portfolio across the two gas hubs. And let's not forget our heritage high margin oil production. And that here I'm talking about the oil production in the Cooper Basin. That's the thin dark gray line that you see at the bottom and what really got Cooper Energy going as a company. Just a couple more slides. Cooper Energy is also building and growing its leading ESG credentials. And this is embedded as a part of our strategy. The growth is being achieved whilst we maintain our industry leading position of being net zero, that's net zero scope one, scope two, and controllable scope three, that's been audited and certified. To maintain and grow this leading position, we work and we have made a commitment to that, something we're going to hold to for the future. We work on three part, we're working on three pathways, which are all interlinked. We're maintaining the net zero position, which delivers competitive advantages relative to our peers, particularly with respect to finance and both debt and, and equity. We're evaluating and pursuing opportunities to further improve the energy and emissions efficiencies at our operating sites. And thirdly, we're assessing new energy opportunities where we have a competitive advantage and, and it's an important and, it adds value to the existing assets and portfolio. The value of this is best illustrated by the number of banks in our enlarged and highly competitive debt facility and the circa 70% institutional share ownership of our register. And both the banks and the institutional shareholders, they do their homework. So to wrap up, gas is critical and it has a key role in the energy transition. A transition where Cooper Energy is supporting the decarbonisation with its own actions. And we're growing a low emissions profile business 
as we grow our gas business. Southeast Australia is desperately short of gas. The market opportunity is compelling to invest in new supply for a company like Cooper Energy. Cooper Energy has the assets to grow with the Otway and the Gippsland basins, and we've got significant running room, and we tick all the elements of what's required for a successful business. We've built a solid base, which generates cash for growth, and these growth projects are now well underway. We are a part of the Southeast Australia gas supply solution. On that note, thank you, and I'm happy to have take any questions and discuss any part of this over lunch. Congratulations, David Maxwell. Well wrapped up. Go and enjoy your lunch, and I'll ring the bell and have you all back here in about an hour.